Hi, this is Paul, and I am on vacation, but just before I went on vacation, Jordan Peterson's message to Christian churches dropped on his new Daily Wire setup. Um, I've spoken a little bit about some of those issues, and I want to make a video at some point addressing it in a little bit more depth. I don't really have the, the time or the way to make a full commentary video on his video, but I'll do what I can with what I've got right here. Now, the first part of the video, I mostly agree with what he said in terms of there's a crisis for boys and men in the culture. Those of you who have been listening to Jordan Peterson a lot know that this is pretty standard stuff for him. I have to adjust my sound a little bit. I've got some different equipment than I usually use. I'm not in my usual setup. So, uh, churches should do more and in fact should make this a strategy for outreach and evangelism for boys and men. I completely agree with that. And churches are one of the last places in at least American society that regularly and unapologetically uh, do sex segregated, specialized, and targeted work for boys and men. And I think in fact that makes the church one of the more unique places for this sort of outreach and ministry. Now, a lot of work what used to be done before sort of the mid-20th century. There used to be um, more boys' schools and all men's colleges. Uh, men's colleges were sort of driven out of the marketplace um, by the, I believe, mostly by the um, by Title IX. Um, there was a set-aside set up for women's colleges. Jonathan Haidt very much doesn't recommend women's colleges. Um, the Army, of course, is less sex-segregated um, than it ever has been. Um, the Army has been a good place for young men, especially who didn't grow up with good structure or sufficient structure to find a place to internalize structure and to really grow up and become responsible, productive men. I know many men in their um, 60s and 70s and 80s who went through the army system and and for many of them that was a that was a positive thing and but the army still does that of course for some but the army is a different place than it used to be I would imagine uh, private institutions that take no government money have far more freedom to do this that's part of the reason I think the church really has a role in helping men do better in our world now, Jordan Peterson doesn't know much church history. Um, one response from a friend of mine was, uh, Protestantism built America, which is very much true. Roman Catholics weren't much, had almost no part in the founding of the United States, and their numbers really only grew after the 1830s, and it was really not until the middle of the 20th century that they began to have a much larger political impact in the United States. And so when he sends, says Protestants are the worst, um, I'm not exactly sure what he means, and I does, don't think it reflects a lot of church history. Now, in the 19th century, the YMCA and YWCA were founded, and those were ministries from what today we would call mainline churches that did significant outreach and formation and development for young men and young women in urban America. And you can still find the Y, as it's often called, in major U.S. cities, all, you know, doing, you know, they'll have pools, they'll have gyms, they'll have programs, but it's, it's not like it was in the 19th century. There are a lot of aspects to 19th century ministry that we um, would look at through different eyes today, but we shouldn't forget the why when it comes to Protestant history in terms of reaching out to boys and men. Now, churches have done sex-segregated ministry for centuries that have focused both on men and on women. Monasteries, of course, is one of the earliest forms of sex-segregated ministries in that you'd have monks and you'd have nuns, usually separately. Um, there are some Roman Catholic orders that are for married couples, and there have been a variety of things that were monastic and, in, to some degrees, um, co-ed, as we might call it. But churches, really, almost right from the beginning, 
have been doing significant ministry with men as men and women as women. Promise Keepers in the 1980s and 90s was a huge evangelical ministry for men that was founded by a college football coach and had a significant impact on an entire generation. And so churches have been doing this kind of work for a very long time. I might say, there have been a lot of denominational Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts ministry. Now, Boy Scouts has been in the news and under fire for um, a number of years now with respect to a number of issues, but most Christian denominations, or not most, but many Christian denominations, including the Christian Reformed Church, have their own separate programs. In the Christian Reformed Church, we have cadets for boys and gems for girls, and many Traditional Christian Reformed churches continue to maintain those kinds of ministries, and they're great ministries. They do a lot for boys and girls. I myself, when I was, our church didn't have a cadet program, but there were a number of Christian Reformed churches within walking distance, and so I participated in one as a boy, and I loved it. The, the Bible studies, I don't remember hardly at all, but the merit badges, the camping, and just the, um, just the mentorship that you would receive from other men in the church was was really critical and valuable. Churches have majored in sports leagues for a very long time and again for men uh, sports leagues are a big big deal. It gives them at least after high school and even college you get a chance to continue to do some things that keep you physically fit, to continue to have men's spaces and to do men's things in the church. Um, separate men's and women's Bible studies. Women's Bible studies are you know, those things have nine lives. They, they really flourish in the Christian Reformed Church. We've had coffee break ministries that have been women's Bible studies, and they've gone very well. It's been tougher to do men's Bible studies, but we've got one going at Living Stones, which it's amongst quite a bit older men, and it's a very valuable thing. Um, every generation and culture have their pushes, and there's always, there's always more to do. Now, his recommendations uh, welcome signs for men. Okay, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but you have to be ready on the inside for what comes at you from the outside. And I think many churches aren't particularly ready to welcome men with men-specific things. And I, so I think, it's, I think churches should think a little bit more intentionally about how to enfold men. Churches often think much more intentionally about how to enfold young families. For many churches, young families are a key demographic tar target audience. Outreach and hospitality are a constant effort for churches that are intentional about outreach and contrary to his you're the worst quip about Protestants, evangelical churches, which are for the most part Protestants, are the most intentional about this of all. Mainline, not quite so much, but evangelical churches have been doing this kind of outreach intentionally focused on men and women and young families for a very, very long time. I think probably the well, for, there are a number of reasons why some churches aren't overtly attractional. Uh, the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox come to mind. Christian Reformed Church has struggled with this. Um, sometimes that lack of being attractional is itself an outreach strategy. Sometimes churches can seem absolutely needy in terms of their desire to welcome and enfold people. But churches pay an awful lot of attention to this, and I doubt Jordan Peterson has any idea of the amount of literature, conversation, conferences that churches are always pouring into outreach ministries. Now, there's always a double-edged sword with this, and many of you who watch this channel know that. Now, people don't like to feel, often don't like to feel like someone else's mission. It can make the church feel desperate and it can make people feel like projects. And this is actually a pretty live debate in churches often. In some churches, if you're a visitor, you'll sort of stand up and be applauded. Uh, some people like that kind of attention. A lot of people don't like that attention. So when the seeker movement went through, um, it became sort of new practices in the church to not have people stand up and applaud and welcome first-time visitors. But churches for a very long time, especially evangelical churches, have been working hard to try to enfold people into their churches. Now, just telling them to go to church is not really a strategy. And 
there were hundreds I did obviously anybody who's followed this channel for a long time and those of you who are new to the channel can if you look at the conversations with a Z the conversations playlist and you go all the way back to 2018 you'll find hundreds literally hundreds of conversations that I've had with mostly young men who got turned on to the idea of Christianity and the Bible and the church and were interested in going to church now a lot of this happened through Jordan Peterson's early videos, his biblical series, his classroom lectures, and also, and I used to, and I, I still do, will tell people, well, why don't you try going to church? I got a lot of feedback from that, and the feedback I got was, unsurprisingly, churches are difficult. Churches are not really, how can I say this, they're not, they're not, they're not like commercial enterprises. They're really communities, and while churches have, especially evangelical churches, have a desire and a need for outreach to enfold new people, their primary focus is not on that, unlike commercial enterprises like stores or clubs. Churches are mostly there to meet the needs of their existing members, and so what pastors do is are always working on sort of a balance between meeting the needs of the members and trying to unfold new members, and that's a constant tension that churches work through. Now, a lot of his best work, I think, in this area happened in what I call Wave 1, which really started from C16 and went to his illness in the middle of 2019. Um, a lot of people went orthodox um, via Jonathan Peugeot, but numerically, when you look at the landscape of American churches, the orthodox churches have been struggling in some ways, especially because they mostly grew out of immigrant communities, and whereas churches can really thrive through immigration, as Generation 2 and Generation 3 happen, a lot of those people, as they Americanize, will tend to drift out of church. And so Orthodox churches have, I think, harvested disproportionately with respect to the Jordan Peterson wave, but those numbers relatively in terms of overall church attendance in America are quite small. One of the things to remember is that the church is massive in America, and even though Jordan Peterson has been a cultural phenomenon, comparatively speaking, his numbers are small, even right now with 5.2 million YouTube subscribers. That's a good size YouTube channel, but it's tiny compared to the numbers of people in the United States, much less the world, who go to church. It might feel a little differently in Canada. Canada is considerably less churched than the United States. Um, many Roman Catholic mainline and evangelicals um, wind up wound up from the first Jordan Peterson wave, you know, looking into churches, but they were a little disappointed that. Well, church didn't sound like the Jordan Peterson biblical series. And of course, anybody who's familiar with church culture, that didn't come as any surprise. I even had a number of visitors show up in my church expecting to hear the kind of stuff they hear in my videos. Those of you who know this channel well know that I have my personal channel, which this is going out on, and there's the church channel. And on the church channel, you'll see church programming. Most of that church programming is addressed to church people, people who are in the church. Churches have their own version of audience capture that they're always struggling with. Churches have their own liturgical, theological, sociological traditions that they maintain. Again, churches have to do this and churches should do this. This is part of the reason churches continue to be a conservative um, a conservative reality in the culture today because in many churches, the main emphasis is focused on maintaining and continuing to evolve, in some cases not evolve, like the Orthodox, their particular tradition. This is why I think that church planting is actually vital in a fast-changing culture, because whereas established churches tend to try to maintain the culture in which the church was planted, as you keep planting new churches, those new church plants do a much better job at addressing the present culture. Now, some very large churches can be nicely multi-generational, and I think that's ideal, but with that multi-generational quality, you always have to sort of mix how much are you addressing the current church and how much are you maintaining the needs of past generations. 
One of the messages that Jordan's given on, a mul on multiple occasions was the demand more from churches. He told this to Bishop Barron in both of his conversations with Bishop Barron. Churches already demand a lot of men. Um, the Christian sexual ethic itself is especially challenging for men. And there are a lot of church programming that tries to help men live up to the demanding Christian sexual ethic. And that's one of the big demands that churches place on men. In his recent conversation with Rod Dreer on the portion that was on Daily Wire, Rod Dreer mentioned that um, personally embracing the Christian sexual ethic instead of sleeping with a variety of girlfriends was one of the major things that brought him to finally becoming a committed Christian and taking his commitments to the church seriously and identifying as a Christian. And so the church already demands a lot of men. Um, the church has you know, tithing expectations of financial and time sacrifice and prioritization. Churches again and again and again preach to people that they should put God first and they should be faithful to their families and they should be honest, good employees. Churches, churches reinforce these kinds of messages all the time. Um, now, demand presumes sort of a lost cultural influence and authority that the church doesn't have. And it's especially surprising seeing a Canadian who himself doesn't go to church reinforce this. In some ways, some of the tone that um, has, I think, been forefronting a lot of Jordan's Daily Wire videos, in fact, I think bears a lot of the weaknesses that a lot of church programming has. Churches can sometimes, in fact, um, if you say to someone, stop preaching at me, well, that, that has the tone that here you have somebody with a degree of presumed authority making angry demands at people. And I think some of the more recent videos from Jordan has very much had that tone. I think challenge is a better word and I think model and setting high expectations are better ways to frame it. I think what you have to do is communicate a compelling vision. And again, I think a lot of what made Jordan's ministry, ministry I called it, uh, Jordan's work in wave one from C16 really until his illness quite transformative is I think in that time he really found a way in again his classroom lectures in the biblical series in a lot of those early, um, even conflictive interviews, he really found a way to challenge men in a very winsome way. When it comes to browbeating, um, demanding, guilting, churches are in fact known for this. And, and I don't think simply taking up that mode really gets us what we want. Now, one of the things that I was also thinking of is that there are very different standards for churches and fandoms. What do I mean by fandoms? Right now with social media, you can gain a large, inf a large audience, you can gain a lot of influence, usually by appealing to certain reactive modes in human beings. Um, you can, the this same, this same thing happens with churches. I remember talking to someone who was talking about a church in another area of Sacramento, and he talked about just how demanding that pastor was that the whole church was just sort of lived in fear of the pastor. Now, in many ways, the pastors that work that get short-term compliance because as long as you sort of have direct influence of guilting people, you can get them to perform in a certain way. In my experience, that has short-term gains, but long-term liabilities. What you really want to do is internalize the structures, internalize the value, and that's usually done through high expectations and a high love. Um, Jonathan Peugeot, in a video that he did with, oh, I forget his name, I've commented on it a few times, when he talks about authority, that's really where authority comes from. It's both high touch and high love together. Um, David Fuller in his piece, Whatever Happened, What Happened to Jordan Peterson, talked about the fact that early on for Jordan, one of his key 
one of his key attractions was authenticity. You had the sense that Jordan was inviting you into his home, inviting you into his office. He was speaking with authority because it became very clear that he cared about men. And that very much came through in his um, little VIP meet and greets after his Wave 1 book tour. Um, it's that combination of high expectation and close attention and love that I think really over the long term develops the kind of internalized structure that grows men up into the kinds of persons who regularly sacrifice and give and act like fully mature men for the benefit of everyone. And I think that's really what we're trying to do rather than sort of browbeating and demanding and you know taking an attitude such as you know beatings will continue until morale improves this kind of scourging again tends to get attraction in the short term people like it when you do it to other people like if there's a group out there that really needs um, a scolding that tends to be what people like a lot is for other people to get scolded there are some people that really like fire and brimstone preaching and sermons that really make them feel guilty. There very much is that culture within church. But for the most part, I think as Jonathan Peugeot said, it's high contact, high care, high love that internalizes the structure into someone and really helps grow men up. Churches are in a bear market right now, but again, churches are massive long-term things. And the internal dynamics of church are very different from the dynamics of a YouTube channel. I've talked a lot about YouTube channels. YouTube channels tend to have churn. You listen to Jordan Peterson for a few months, and then you'll, he's kind of becomes map territory, and then you're on to maybe Jonathan Peugeot, or you listen to Paul Vanderclay for a little while, and then they become map territory. Initially, you're doing a lot of projecting on people, and they're saying everything you want them to say, but after a while, the projection recedes, and more and more of them bleed through, and some of their weaknesses and their foibles and their annoyances come through, and so you tend to move on to other YouTube channels or other influencers. Churches play a much longer game. Churches are supposed to be homes and communities and contexts in which you can live in multi-generationally. That's a very different thing than, than running a YouTube channel. Influence, influences, influencers and fandoms have churn. And people will be on and they'll be off Jordan Peterson in a matter of weeks, months, or perhaps even years. Churches pay attention to the very long term, and it's for that reason that you'll get this layering of messaging, especially in a context like ours where you have all of these significant cultural divides. So many of the established churches out there have been programmed to address, of course, the one day I do this video is the day that the landscapers have to come and run some machine outside my window. Churches think in generations, not in clicks and views or hours watched on YouTube. And so it tends to produce a very different approach to people. And I think a far longer term, more stable approach to, te to people. What do I think churches should do more of? Churches need to continue to plant new churches. Because when you have rapid intergenerational change like this, whereas multi-generation is very helpful in a type, in a kind like this, initially to get people in the door, you often need churches planted for a particular demographic niche. Um, over time and within the community of churches, you can tend to expand that and then you can do more multi-generational things. But what I think one of the things that we really need are is more church planting. I think we need more sex segregated ministry. Uh, women already excel in this and currently in our cultural framework, nobody has a problem with women only ministry. They have a problem with men only ministry and the church is one of the few places that unapologetically does men only ministry and I think men need to lean into this. Um, I don't think the church should be afraid of being countercultural. In fact, and this has been known for a long time, generally speaking, being countercultural is a positive for church growth and church health. 
Lyle Shaler, who did a ton of church research in the middle of the 20th century, noted this. Countercultural churches grow. Countercultural churches are stronger. A lot of the values we're talking about in this video and that Jordan was talking about in his video are countercultural values. Churches should lean into them. And in fact, churches that practice them now will grow stronger. In fact, in some ways, the more a church is criticized, the stronger that church will be because the members turn in and look to each other for support against the dominant culture. Now, that can sometimes set up a culture of insularity, which can be negative. And for that reason, churches are always trying to modulate between turning inward, looking to each other, meeting each other's needs, specifically targeting the things that are of interest and important for that subculture, for that tradition within the church. Churches also have to watch that, that they don't become so insular that they no longer can communicate with the outside culture. So churches shouldn't be afraid of being countercultural. You should start uh, estuary, start, not and estuary, start an estuary group. I think an estuary group is a good way to attract men because at this point, mostly men have been attracted to estuary, not exclusively, but um, I think that can actually both give you the sense of those of us together and not being too insular. Now, if Jordan Peterson wants to help, well, critique from the outside of the church is low resolution. Jordan hasn't gone to church regularly, um, at least since the age of 13, and I don't know how often his family went before then. During the Cold War, going to church was just sort of a package of being a respectable family in North America, less in Canada than in the United States. If Jordan wants to work with the church, he's probably going to one degree or another get in the church or be in more conversation with church leaders rather than sort of lobbing things in from the outside. A lot of the help that he has given the church um, came in wave one, and I think he's got to give real attention about what's going to be effective in terms of what he wants to do. My advice for him would be um, worry less about the money and the metrics, because I think right now probably a lot of his growth is among conservative individuals, and especially with Daily Wire, that's going to be who his audience is going to be. Whereas in Wave 1, as I spoke about in the, um, the breakup video between Rebel Wisdom and Jordan Peterson, in Wave 1 he had a far broader reach, even though it was just getting started. And I think if he would practice a lot of what he did in Wave 1, he could in fact speak to a broader audience. I think some of his best stuff were the college lectures, the biblical series, and you know more of a context where he can demonstrate his ability to sort of code switch between being demanding and firm but yet listening and available as i said before in that jonathan peugeot video authority comes from sort of that switching back and forth so there are there are a bunch of youtube channels out there now that are um newer YouTube channels that are doing commentary and reaction videos. And I've been looking at them, and almost all of them are using Wave 1 materials, not Wave 2 and not Wave 3. Uh, Kathy Newman interview, the GQ interview. I think a big challenge for Peterson looking forward is going to be figuring out the context where he can actually be most effective, where he can sort of himself be that combination that we saw very early on that I think the university really gave him. I, I think the university was a really a unique place where he could, you know, show what he had, what he's learned over the last decades of his life, how to both be clear about his message, but also be available and listening to the opposition. And so I think if he can recapture that, I think he can probably regain a lot of the helpfulness that he has been to the church, especially between 2016 and 2019. I think seeing him as a knowledgeable seeker 
And I, I see that more often when he's in partic conversation with particular individuals. I think the conversation he did from his office via Zoom with or Skype with Jonathan Peugeot, again, was one of the better ones. Um, his conversation with John Verveke, again, one of the better ones. If, if you look at his ability to be a knowledgeable seeker, he's much more winsome than sort of lobbing culture war bombs from a nice set with two cameras from Daily Wire. He sort of comes off in Daily Wire as sort of an angry culture warrior. And, and I, don't think that's, I don't think that's his most effective self for actually helping the church. His knowledge and integration of subjects in turn, that he demonstrated in the biblical series was what really caught the eye of theologians, pastors, and I think a lot of seekers that had been very much turned off to the church. As I said before, part of the reason Jordan Peterson caught my eye in 2017 was exactly that. What I had seen was that there were two big roads, especially for men, there was one big road leading men out of the church, and that was new atheism, and to a degree, sort of new age spirituality. And it was only with Jordan Peterson that I saw people coming back who had taken those roads. And the Jordan Peterson that had sort of given all of those people a second thought about Christianity was the Jordan Peterson of his college lectures, the Jordan Peterson of his biblical series, the Jordan Peterson of the Kathy Newman interview, of the British GQ interview, of many of those early interviews. Now, I don't know if he's healthy enough now to actually engage in the same way that he did back in those days. We'll have to see. He spoke many times about his training as a clinical psychologist in his ability to not get defensive, to respond productively, as, again, he showed in many ways to Kathy Newman. Go back and look at some of these channels that are now doing response videos to Jordan Peterson. And these videos are less than a year old. They're almost all using the Kathy Newman and the, the British GQ interviews because he showed a capacity in those interviews that I think really caught widespread attention and attracted people to him and to these conversations. These are exactly the kinds of conversations that we're trying to host in estuary groups that are knowledgeable, they're seeking, they're engaging, they respect individuals. They don't make people feel like projects. That's a huge problem in the church. The other huge problem in the church that I talked about is preaching in the negative sense of the word, where you feel like you know everything, you feel like you have it all together, and you're going to lecture people, or even worse, you're going to angrily scold people. This doesn't work over the long term. Over the short term, you might gather some individuals who sort of need that structure and desire that structure and desire a, a daddy figure sort of talking to them directly. But over the long term, they're going to have to internalize that structure. And again, I think how Jonathan Peugeot pitched authority in that one, particularly, in that one particular video. Maybe I'll have to go back and find it or maybe I can link to it. See, so, you now my camera's a little off because I don't have my usual setup. I think that's the way to do it. And so if Jordan wants to help, I would invite him to lean more into the kinds of stuff that he was doing, especially in the first wave. Have those conversations with people who differ from him, but figure out how to have them in a productive way. Now, there is, of course, the broader church challenge. And I started doing videos because Jordan Peterson was very helpful, I think, um, in the larger religious conversation. Politics is now, religion is always, and Nassim Tlaib has his Lindy effect, which means if you stick to topics that are perennial, if you stick to topics that are much more religious and much, much less political, what you do now will be useful in many different ages and many different times. Part of the problem of political punditry is it's always about the now. So it's highly salient, it's highly motivational, it gets a lot of clicks, but it's not good 
personal formation and not good character formation. Uh, Jordan, Peter Jordan Peterson has a lot to offer in these conversations, but I fear that prioritizing the political will pigeonhole him further. Um, I think it plays into the framing that was done at the end of Wave 1 by mass media. And the question that he's really going to ask himself is, does he really want to be in Ben Shapiro's stable of characters? I'm not saying anything against Ben Shapiro in that. It's that Ben Shapiro's brand and the Daily Wire has this brand. Now, this is early days of Daily Wire Plus, and I understand that they, in fact, want to replace Hollywood. That's a big thing. Now, as I mentioned in the... Now, someone's moving furniture upstairs. As I mentioned in the breakup, the Rebel Wisdom Jordan Peterson breakup video, there's some indication that, well, maybe, maybe Daily Wire Plus will be able to break out. Jordan Peterson, in the written piece that he had announcing the Daily Wire thing, said that he wants to expand. Well, if he's going to expand, he's going to have to give very different kinds of videos than... Yesterday, this place was completely quiet. Now, I've got, a, I've got a lawnmower to the left of me and a furniture mover on top. They're probably complaining about that loud voice down in the floor below. Well, I'm almost done. Um, I think, again, what made that those early moments transformative, it was also, it was also the moment but it was the way in which he was able to really task switch. You know, you could hear him speak with authority and with anger and with stridency in those Wave 1 videos, but then he would switch and he would be much more not just an angry, demanding father, but also a caring, loving father, and he's got that capacity. And I don't know if we're going to see that voice through Daily Wire because that's not their shtick. I want to end with a couple of G.K. Chesterton quotes that I think illustrate what I'm talking about. There are people who say they wish Christianity to remain as a spirit. They mean very literally that they wish it to remain as a ghost. It is not going to remain as a ghost. What follows this process of apparent death is not the lingering of the shade, it is the resurrection of the body. These people who are quite prepared to shed pious and reverential tears over the sepulcher of the Son of Man, what they are not prepared for is the Son of God walking once more upon the morning. I have said that Asia and the ancient world had an air of being too old to die. Christendom has, a, has the very opposite fate. Christendom has had a series of revolutions, and in each one of them, Christianity has died. Christianity has died many times and risen again, for it had a God who knew the way out of the grave. And so, whereas I very much want Jordan Peterson's partnership with the church, my entire YouTube channel, in many ways, is an expression of that. At the same time, having seen very closely the ways in which Jordan Peterson has been helpful to the Christian and church conversation, I think I have some ideas about what aspects will probably continue to bear fruit in the future. And for that reason, well, that's what shapes what I do here. Well, I hope this made sense, and I hope the hotel bandwidth is sufficient so that I can get this out to you in some kind of timely way. So, you know, thanks for watching. Leave a comment.